Hello, welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very honored and privileged to have the mighty, the wonderful Tom Holland. Uh, Tom is an award-winning historian, biographer, and broadcaster. He's the author of numerous books, including Rubicon, Triumph and Tragedy of the Roman Republic, Persian Fire, uh, Millennium, The End of the World and the Forging of Christendom, In the Shadow of the Sword, Dynasty, Dominion, and the newest, Pax. Uh, Tom is also uh, an adapter. He's adapted Homer and Herodotus. Uh, His translation, actually, of Herodotus was published in 2013, Penguin Classics. And in 2007, he was the winner of the Classical Association Prize, which is awarded to the person who's done the most to promote the study of the language, literature, and civilization of ancient Greece and Rome. He's also a presenter on BBC Radio 4's Making History, and he's been on numerous uh, TV documentaries. He's also uh, got his own podcast, which is fantastic, everyone should follow, called The Rest is History. And uh, for two years, he was the chair of the Society of Authors and is the chair of the British Library's PLR Advisory Committee. So it goes without saying that uh, his reputation precedes him. I was very happy to get Tom on the podcast and to talk about his new book, uh, Pax, uh, which is about the golden age of the Roman Empire. We give a kind of overview about Pax Romana, as it's known. Talk about the greatness of Augustus, Nero as a tyrant the chaotic year of four emperors of AD 69, the Judean revolt, Vespasian, who kind of brought the peace, the importance of uh, Pliny, Pliny the Elder. Uh, We talk about the environmental context for for peace, the five good emperors, and the rule of Trajan and Hadrian. And we also kind of talk about and question what do we do with this idea of empire and, uh, and how we study it and how we understand it and uh, many other uh, topics. Um, You know, obviously, Tom is is brilliant for his work, but he's um, funny, he's warm, he's he's so relatable in in many ways, and he's able to take this encyclopedia of knowledge about the Roman Empire and just kind of distill it and make it conversational and make it relatable. And that's why he's so good. That's why he's so good on... On, uh, on radio and podcast and TV and and also in the written form and uh, he was an absolute delight to 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 talk with um, about um, an empire that I think is still important for us. It's still important for us to understand many of these things and and seeing a lot of the parallels even with humans in our modern day. So um, very very honored to have him on. As always, you can listen to this conversation all the conversations at uh, convergingdialogues.substack.com. I'm also on YouTube. Subscribe, follow, and share widely with friends and people that would be interested. And so now I bring you the great Tom Holland. I am here with the wonderful, the great Tom Holland. Uh, Tom, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast. Big honor. Oh, thank, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, of course. You have written so many wonderful books, and the new one you have out is Pax, War and Peace in Rome's Golden Age. Uh, quite the tour de force. It's tremendous. I really, really enjoyed reading this. It was, uh, oh, it was This I'm, podcast is getting off to such a great start. <laughs> no, seriously. I loved, I loved Dominion, obviously. I mean, most people know you for Dominion, I think, if, if they've read your stuff. Um, but this one was, this one was exceptional. It was quite exceptional. Well, it's it's kind of um, the, in a way the negative image of Dominion, which Dominion is all about Christianity, how important Christianity is, mm-hmm. was all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is um, looking at the world that existed before Christianity, mm-hmm. um, and it, it kind kind of covers the golden age of the Roman Empire, the Roman peace, the Pax mm-hmm. Pax Romana. So mm-hmm. hence the title. Mm-hmm. Um, and Christians do appear, but they're a very kind of you know they're I, I say in the introduction they're like little mammals in a mesozoic ecosystem (laughs) (laughs) and i'm very much focusing on the dinosaurs in this one (laughs) fierce and glamorous and terrifying (laughs) that's great so okay so pax romana i mean it's it's one of the the big hallmarks of the roman empire um you say in the book that this period and roman empire in general gave us so many wonderful things sanitation medicine education 
uh, public order. That's wine. the Monty Python list, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess just give us a kind of general overview. I mean, there's so there's. I mean, people have this debate of when does it end and oh, what are the great periods. So why did you choose to focus on this period, and uh, what makes Pax Romana so great? Well, does it make? Is it great? I mean, that's kind of the that's question. The question. That that's the question. That's the question. That's the question. Book, um, <laughs> because although the title is Pax, the, the Latin word for peace, um, the argument of the book is that that peace is upheld at the point of a sword, and mm. so uh, there's actually quite a lot of killing and warfare <laughs> in a book that is uh, called peace. peace. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's the third in a series of books. I mean, it's completely self-contained, so you don't have to have read the previous two books at all. But it is the third in a series of um, of books that began with a, a book called Rubicon, which described the end of the Roman Republic. So that's the age of Julius Caesar and Cicero and Cleopatra. Um, and then the second book, Dynasty, was uh, the age of Caesar Augustus and his family. Um, and this book, Pax, opens with the death of Nero, who was the last of Augustus's living descendants. So with the death of Nero... The Roman world is faced with the question of what happens next if there is no one with the blood of the divine Augustus in his veins to rule the Roman world. Um, do you go back to a republican system of government of the kind that existed before Augustus? And it's pretty clear the answer is to that is no, because um, it's just not going to work anymore. Um, but if you're going to have rule by an emperor, um, how are you going to choose an emperor? You know, where, where are the emperor is going to come from? And the attempt to answer that question plunges the Roman world into um, a terrible series of civil wars that lasts for a year and more. And the year that follows the death of Nero, so uh, Nero dies in AD 68, the year that follows AD 69 is remembered as the year of the four emperors, which is never a good name in ancient history. <laughs> you have, basically, you have more than one emperor in a year. It's generally bad news. Mm -hmm. um, but from that cycle of civil war, it turns out that it's not, you know, it hasn't been a kind of existential risk to the empire. It, it's a kind of surface froth and that the fundamentals remain very, very strong. And the empire not only endures, but provides across the whole span of the Mediterranean and beyond a relative degree of peace of an order that had never existed before and would never exist again. So the Roman Empire is the only unitary power to have ruled the whole of the Mediterranean. That's never happened since. And although it, it is absolutely, it is a military autocracy, um, it brutally suppresses any hint of, rebe of rebellion. And there are a number of, of very celebrated rebellions in this period. Um, nevertheless, it, it is an astonishing achievement for a pre-industrial um, ancient empire to have maintained peace for as long as it does and relative degrees of stability so the book is really about what are the what are the costs of that and what are the benefits of it yeah i think that there's these there's all these interesting stories that maybe some people have heard before but i i love the way in which you kind of have this nice thread of kind of moving from period to period with with certain players that are involved so you obviously mentioned augustus we don't have to talk about him at length but just kind of it's sort of kind of where it sort of starts, right? Of how he did a lot of wonderful things and kind of really brings the kind of the I think, empire there. I, I, I think he is probably the most astonishing political figure in the entire history of yeah. the yeah. West. Because it's not just that he restores peace to a shattered world. I mean, other other rulers have done that. But it's the way in which he persuades a people who had previously been proud of their Republican traditions mm -hmm. and proud of the fact that they, unlike other peoples, were not ruled by a, you know, a single man. It, it's the way that he persuades them that actually um, the establishment of this autocracy that Augustus pulls off mm -hmm. is going with the grain of Roman tradition. So it's an incredible confidence trick. So if you think of, of politics as the art of deceiving <laughs> people. It certainly is. Manipulating and deceiving. <laughs> yeah, manipulating and deceiving. <laughs> but also giving them absolute, you know, the benefits of, of, of a relative degree of peace. Sure. Augustus' achievement is staggering. And everyone kind of from that point on lives in his shadow. And the question is, how do you do that? And mm -hmm. this book is, you know, as I said, how do you do it if you don't actually have someone who's descended from Augustus on hand? Do do you think a lot of that is just his innate skills, his his personality? Do you think what do you think yeah, it was think, about him? I think he was unbelievably ruthless when mm. he had to be. Mm. Um, 
but he didn't pursue violence for its own end and mm-hmm. he didn't pursue cruelty for its own end um and having obtained supreme power in the Roman state which was always his ambition having done that he was then content to pretend that he didn't have as much power as he actually wielded mm-hmm. and to kind of uh soft soap his autocracy um so i you know he was he ended up um being called father of his country pater patriae and of course the mafia is headed by a godfather i think he was the the supreme godfather of roman culture mm. he mm. and there was something of the mafia boss about him in his 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 ascent to power but then having reached power he kind of launders his reputation mm. he he kind of washes out the stains of blood from it so that he comes to be remembered as a prince of peace even though he'd he'd won supreme power by clambering over the bodies of his fellow citizens hmm. well you know after him shortly after you have nero so we, we actually don't have to spend that much time on nero because i want to talk about 69 but um i mean he was pretty pretty terrible <laughs> he was he was a tyrant <laughs> and and then he ends up killing himself I mean, how well, much... he's remembered. He he's absolutely remembered as one of the, the archetype of a terrible emperor, a yeah, bad emperor, yeah. mm. and he's hated um, certainly by Roman historians, and he's he's also very strongly disliked by uh, Christian writers who commemorate him as you know the beast in the Book of Revelation and so on. So he has a very bad reputation, but I think it's possible to distinguish the kind of the lineaments of. Um, a, a policy which was basically to appeal over the heads of the traditional um, policymakers, the traditional elites, mm-hmm. and appeal to the people beyond it by lavishing them with with bread and with circuses. And Nero was a supreme entertainer, mm-hmm. and um, you know to cast it, say, in contemporary American terms, um, Nero was was less a John McCain than mm-hmm. he was a Donald Trump. Mm-hmm. And if you think of people maybe in 2000 years time trying to make sense of Donald Trump's reputation and all they have is the New York Times. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could get the outlines of Trump's mm-hmm. career from the New York Times, mm-hmm. but you'd probably want, you know, Fox News or something to even it out. <laughs> and we just don't have that for Nero. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's a good point though that's a good point we have a we have a very curated kind of history of sorts of how we understand Nero right so 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 the um the greatest historian of this age is is Tacitus who's writing in the reigns of Trajan and Hadrian who are two of the great great emperors of this period um and Tacitus um really really detested him. <laughs> <laughs> So, so it's Nero's misfortune in a way that he is, you know, his the chief narrative account of his reign was written by someone who was one of the greatest historians and stylists who ever who ever wrote. Mm-hmm. I think he was still a pretty terrible man, but he perhaps wasn't quite as bad as his sure. reputation suggests. Sure, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so you you get this this you get, we get landed into you know AD sixty nine. And we have four emperors in this one year, and you spend some time talking yeah. about it in the in the book. The only thing I have as a comparison point for me in the modern age is there's a couple of uh, in, in modern times uh, South American countries that have had like a, some coups, and then they'll have someone a president for like a week, and then a month, and then they have someone else that comes yeah. in. That's my like closest kind of analog. Well, to this. it's not called Latin America for nothing. <laughs> So how similar is it to things that we see this in today's day and age? Or was it just like a chaotic year? Like what was going on there? It is a chaotic year because, because as I say, the, 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 there's, it's about legitimacy. You can, it's a terrifying business being, being an emperor. You know, you are one of, one of the emperors compared it to um, holding a wolf by its ears. Mm. You you have to appeal to the traditional elites, the senator, the senators, you know, the equivalent of the New York Times. Uh, you have to appeal to the masses. You have to to entertain them. You have to keep them fed, and you have to appeal to the military because without the military, you are nothing. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe a classical kind of metaphor would be to say it's like um, it's a bit like driving the, the chariot of the sun. That if you 
if you go too close to the earth then it burns up and if you go cl- too close to the uh, to the sky then everything freezes it, it's really really difficult and it's a pre-industrial age as well so there's no kind of communications so caesar's power is on the one hand you know you might think it's absolute he, he's the mediator between the people and the gods mm-hmm. so he has a crucial role in the functioning of the empire but in other ways he's almost powerless because he doesn't have the leaves of power he he, he can't you know he doesn't have a kind of fully functioning civil service or anything like that so he's simultaneously unbelievably powerful and powerless Mm -hmm. and that's a really really awkward thing i think for any ruler and so it means that in this year that follows the death of nero the last of augustus's um heirs how do you how do you gain legitimacy and it turns out that the way you gain legitimacy is you have an army at your back and tacitus says that the secret of empire was out you didn't have to be in rome to make yourself emperor because the legions are by and large not in Rome. They're stationed along the the distant frontiers. And so you have a succession of basically warlords who fight against each other. And the man who emerges, Vespasian, a bit like Augustus, turns out to be a supremely brilliant politician. And, you know, that's a great piece of luck for the Roman state because he's able to bandage up the wounds and set the Roman uh, world back on a stable footing. Mm. Maybe it maybe it'll be a, a type of footnote here or whatever, but you do spend some time in the book on this about the uh Judean rebellion, right? Which was was that kind of image of some of the things that we see and how in this chaotic period you were seeing some of these revolts and these rebellions and these things, both internally and externally, it seems like. How how hmm. did how did the military power kind of factor in with the Judean, you know, rebellion at the time? Well, so so the Judean revolt begins before uh, Nero's death. Mm-hmm. And the man who is sent to suppress it is actually Vespasian, the man who in the era of the four emperors will emerge triumphant. Mm-hmm. Um, and when he goes off to become emperor uh, in, in AD 69, he leaves behind his son, Titus, with responsibility for finishing off the rebellion by capture, capturing the Judean capital, Jerusalem, which mm-hmm. Titus does in AD 70, with momentous consequences that reverberate right the way into the present day. Mm-hmm. And because the destruction of Jerusalem and its temple is so influential on the emergence of what comes to be rabbinical Judaism. So the Judaism that we have today yeah. is a, a way of understanding the inheritance of Jewish scripture and Hebrew scripture that has to do without the temple. Um, without, you know, if the temple still functioned, then rabbinical Judaism probably wouldn't exist at all in the form that we have today. Yeah. And because of that, and also because of the impact that it it has on Christian traditions, um, the Judean revolt has an absolutely outsized role, I think, in the history of rebellions in the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you look at it in the context of the age, the Judeans are not really that that special. I don't think there was anything inherent within Judea in in the, the first century AD that made the war inevitable. I don't think it was anything to do with the fact that the Judeans had worshipped a single god and therefore they were uniquely strange and aberrant. Um, the Romans certainly saw them as being weird, but they saw everyone as being weird. Mm. So, you know, the Judeans might worship a single god, but they didn't castrate themselves like Syrian priests were prone to doing or worship gods with animal heads like the Egyptians did or mm. kind of murder people in oaken groves like the Britons did. Um, every, the Romans saw everyone was odd. Um, But what happens is that there'd been a terrible fire in Rome uh, under Nero. Nero wanted to repair it, so that meant he needed cash. And so he sends tax collectors out basically to screw as much money as he can out of the hapless provincials. And in Judea, an unfortunate sequence of circumstances ends up with a rebellion and a legion being annihilated in an ambush. And once that's happened, you know, the Romans are not going to allow a legion's destruction to pass um unpunished and there's a kind of cascade effect of of terrible consequences Mm. so you mentioned already uh vespasian how how did he kind of have that start of that flavian dynasty and and begin this kind of period of peace that you talk about in the second half of the book how was he what did he i guess do different that the other three emperors didn't that kind of were saying, okay, how do we how do we move out of this chaos? Well, he, you know, he's kind of like the guy in a in a bar watching 
other people get punched or arrested or knifed <laughs> or whatever and then he steps in and <laughs> takes over um the, the the three emperors who precede him are, are, are killed in rapid succession because they're unable to root their power in um in a kind of a, a degree of military sport that span, spans the whole empire Vespasian bides his time he he waits until he's fairly confident that he's going to win that his that, that the third emperor in the year of the three emperors a, a man called Vitellius who is famous for eating pies he's enormously large and Tacitus has this incredibly exaggerated description of him as he's descending on Rome from the Rhine where he's been one of the commanders of of the whole of Italy shaking as wagons bring him <laughs> donuts and <laughs> pizzas and I mean obviously the uh, the Roman equivalent of those um and so so Vitellius is seen as a kind of uh, a lazy, fat, incompetent. Mm. Um, and when Vespasian uh, sends his troops, um, he's able to secure peace pretty rapidly. Um, and he just turned, he's he's from a kind of humble stock. He's from um, peasant stock from outside Rome. Um, it, you know, he has no senatorial pedigree at all, unlike his, his predecessors. Mm. He was appointed by Nero to the Judean command precisely because he was a nobody. Um, but this gives him um, a, a kind of inherent popularity in the way that, um, you know, someone who is not snooty, mm. someone who has the popular touch, even today might might have. So it was said of, of, of Vespasian that he looked like a man who was straining to have a shit. And if you were, uh, <laughs> anyone listening to this, you want to Google, a, you know, a bust of Vespasian, I think you'd immediately see what that joke said. And it was said to his face and he found it quite funny. Mm. So he was an outsider. You know, he was uh, he one was of the people outsider. of sorts. He, he kind of he was a brilliant military commander. He had the popular touch mm. and um, he was a bit like Augustus. He was very adept at being brutal when he had to be. But, uh, you know, not not basically playing the print, the, the, the prince of, of peace mm. once he had seized control of the commanding heights of the Roman state. So I think Vespasian is the most Augustan figure of the emperors um who, who follow augustus in the in the book you talk about uh is it pliny right he's he's the he's pliny, yeah there are, there are two plinies yeah, so the, very confusing the one there's, you mentioned in the book is, is is very important for understanding the context of pax romana so could you talk about well so there are two so, so there's the elder pliny mm-hmm. who is um he's kind of a career civil servant um so he he, he serves in various administrative posts around the empire in various provinces, um, and he ends up the admiral of the fleet in the Bay of Naples at a place called Mycenaeum. Um, but he writes single-handedly an enormous encyclopedia, um, as, as essentially an attempt to integrate into a single book everything that's known about the world. And he feels that he can do this because, as a Roman, he belongs to the people who rule the world. So whereas previously it was very difficult to obtain information, now he can do it. And it's kind of interesting. I think that there, there, there seems to be something about um, empires at their peak that, and I guess it's the kind of the globalizing ambitions of, of great powers at their pinnacle that, that lends itself to encyclopedias. So when the British Empire was in its, its, in its heyday, um, the Encyclopedia Britannica was invented mm. and of course now the american empire is at its height and we have wikipedia um but the equivalent of those in the roman time was pliny's encyclopedia it was an absolutely astonishing achievement he you know and he's running the roman fleet at this time mm. and he does it basically by not allowing himself any spare time so even if he, he he never walks anywhere he goes in a litter so that he can sit in the litter and kind of read books and make notes and write up his encyclopedia mm. he famously dies in um the eruption of Vesuvius um which happens the uh in, shortly after the death of Vespasian um in AD 79 when he's succeeded by Titus and because he's the admiral of the fleet he has a charge of a whole load of ships that go off to investigate um the eruption of Vesuvius um he's doing this partly to do an evacuation program which he can't do because there's too much kind of pumice and rubbish in the in the, the harbors by the time he arrives there but also because he's just very interested in it 
you know, he pleads very much the kind of guy who told that a massive volcanic eruption is happening would say, brilliant, let's go, let's go check it out. And so he he ends up dead, very sadly. But we know about this because his nephew, who is known to posterity as the younger Pliny, who goes on to become, again, a very distinguished public servant in the reign of Trajan, he writes this, these two very famous letters describing the destruction of, of Pompeii and the death of his uncle, um, the, the elder Pliny. And it's one of the kind of the great, great scenes, not, ju- not just of Roman history, I think, but of, um, of of global history. It's probably, I would guess, the most fe- celebrated natural disaster in history. Mm. So um, it's kind of wonderful centerpiece mm. for this book. And what I really enjoyed doing in PAX was eating all the various sources of knowledge for that eruption, which aren't just literary. It's not just Pliny's letters. Obviously, there's the archaeology as well of, of Pompeii mm. and Herculaneum. And there's also the volcanology of it, which has really been refined over recent years. Mm. So you can put all that together and have um, a pretty accurate sense of what is going on, you know, what it, ha- how the volcano is behaving and how that is then impacting people, certainly in Pompeii and Herculaneum, which famously get buried, but also, say, in Mycenae, mm. the, uh, the, the, the centre of the, of the Roman fleet. Yeah, you, you were giving in the beginning part of the, the second part of the book you this uh, kind of detailed account of Pompeii and also uh, Campania, yeah. um, which which you, you're talking about this context. How was the environment, I guess, important for for peace? Because sometimes you know people will have different terrains that they live in, or there'll be certain types of things that they can grow or not grow. But how were these types of environmental context important for you know maintaining peace? Well, I think what I think one of the things that's become clear over recent years is that the, the climate generally in this period was pretty good. Mm. Um, it, it actually w- was conducive to agriculture, and without agriculture in antiquity, there is nothing. You know, by and large, people are living a, a subsistence existence, but the, um, the 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 length of peace. And the scale of Roman territory means that you can have in this period what you probably won't have again until the 17th century in the Dutch Republic in England, um, the kind of the, the birthplace of birthplaces of modern capitalism. The Roman world in this period was probably verging on the wealth that you get in that period. Mm-hmm. And that's because um, different regions can specialise in what they're good at Mm. and be relatively confident that trade links will hold up and that the imperial government will uphold laws that enable trade to be sustained across vast distances. So um, that's not actually answering your question, is it? I've slalomed off peace and started (laughs) talking about the the Roman economy. (laughs) But but just, just I mean, the the, the base point is that that the, the... the environment is unbelievably important because without agriculture, you have nothing. Mm. And if those essentially benign climatic conditions exist for a lengthy period of time across a large span of unified territory, then you can have what you see in this period, which is an increasingly um, interlinked and coherent kind of globalizing economy. Mm. Yeah. I think it's 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 always interesting to see how certain periods will really thrive in certain contexts and other periods less so. And I think it's also interesting how the climate will continue to change. Of course, there's not that much change, you know, within a hundred years. But when you're looking at, you know, several dynasties, it can be quite different in certain parts of, of the world, which is really, really fascinating. You mentioned the um the five good emperors. Uh we get to the to the five, the five mm-hmm. good ones, starting with Nerva. Um can you talk about how? Well, I guess just kind of as a, as a kind of meta question here. Why, why do we call it the five good ones? Who who came up with that phrase? Or well, it's all spin. It's all spin. <laughs> uh-huh. um, well, it's not entirely spin. So these are the emperors who rule uh, from Nerva, as you say, who comes to power uh, at the end of the first century AD, um, right the way up to Marcus Aurelius, who uh, viewers of Gladiator will remember um, is played by Richard Harris and is the father of Commodus. Um, uh, and Gibbon, in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, begins the decline and fall of the Roman Empire with the death of Marcus Aurelius and the succession of, of Commodus. And um, Nerva had come to power in the wake of a coup. So the last of the Flavians, the younger son of Vespasian, a man called Domitian, 
um, who was very, very autocratic, but actually pretty effective. Um, but people didn't like him, and he got killed in a, in a palace coup. Um, and so it was absolutely in the interests of everybody involved from that point on to blacken his memory. Mm. And so the more his memory was blackened, the more the the fame and reputation of the emperors who succeeded him mm. were upgraded. Mm. Um, and this is this benefited one emperor in particular, a man called Trajan, mm -hmm. who was remembered by the Romans as the Optimus Princeps, the best of emperors. Mm. Um, and the reason for that was that um, Trajan basically enabled the Romans to have their cake and eat it. He enabled them to have all the fruits of peace, but he also enabled them to feel that they were still a great martial power. Mm. So one of the things that worried Tacitus, the, the great historian of this period, is that actually empire was very bad for the Romans because um, the more lands you ruled, the more wealth you had, the more luxuries you could purchase, the softer you became, the more depraved you became. And so this sense that's still quite popular that the Roman Empire becomes decadent, this basically derives from from Tacitus, but he's writing as a kind of stern moralist who basically thinks that the Romans should all have been taking, you know, cold showers and eating turnips and things like that, rather than engage it, rather than indulging in all the riches that their empire had brought them. And he was very, very worried about this. Um, you know, he thought that the Romans were soft compared, say, to the Germans who hadn't been suborned by the the, the ease and the wealth of civilization. Mm. But under Trajan. Tacitus dares to hope that it's possible to have both, that you can have, you know, all the luxury products in the markets and the hot baths and the entertainments in the in the Colosseum and all these kind of wonderful things, all the wonderful fruits of civilization, hurrah for, for, for Rome, while simultaneously going off and conquering barbarians, which Trajan does with great facility. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, Trajan is always remembered as basically, you know, the model of what an emperor should be. Again, I think this is slightly overdone because actually Trajan, towards the end of his reign, embarks on um, what everyone uh, uh, listening will know is, is 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 not necessarily a brilliant foreign policy move, which he invades Iraq um, and it all goes tits up. Um, and Trajan, Trajan dies and leaves his successor, Hadrian, in this absolute mess. And Hadrian's solution is to withdraw from Iraq. And um, Sounds familiar. Yeah, there are certain history, history kind of, does certain, repeat itself, doesn't yeah, it? <laughs> well, there are sort of echoes that sound across the millennia. Right. <laughs> so I guess you could say Domitian really kind of does set up Trajan for success. I know you're talking about the yeah, spin definitely. here, but there's a there's yeah. a kind of you know, it didn't just come out of nothing and kind of there's this of kind of not. setting him up for, no, for saying, here so, you go. So the 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 great crisis in Domitian's reign is um that there is a very a proactive um, barbarian, as, as the, the Romans would have a kingdom called Dacia, which lies beyond the Danube, basically covering what's now Romania. Mm. And um, they're very rich because they've got lots of gold mines and silver mines. And this enables them to sponsor a very predatory kingdom. Um, and this is very bad news for the Romans because um, they didn't really have the military infrastructure to cope with this power on their doorstep. So Domitian's achievement is basically to summon the manpower that is concentrated along the line of the Danube, that Trajan, after Domitian's assassination, is able to come along and uh, and lead it. Um, and so he basically gets all the glory and poor Domitian gets nothing but obloquy. Mm. You, you, you were talking about how Trajan kind of, you know, kind of dominated some of his temperament and things like that. You know, one question I'm curious here is how did he kind of handle the Parthian Empire, you know, some Persia, precursor to Persia. Um, I recently talked with uh, Adrian Goldsworthy, uh, and he just wrote this great book about Rome and Persia, about their 700-year kind of rivalry. Um, how, how do you understand how he handled another big empire right across Armenia, you know, <laughs> and right over yeah. there to the east? Well, I mean, the Parthians are, they're, so they're Iranian people. Mm -hmm. um, but they are the rulers of Iraq. So when Trajan invades Iraq, he is attacking the Parthian Empire. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Parthian capital, um, as I'm sure Adrian will have said, is a place called Tessaphon, which is not far from, from Babylon, just down from where Baghdad stands now. Yeah. Um, so Trajan's... 
The Parthians had had always been a thorn in the side of the Romans. They had notoriously beaten uh, one of the great warlords in the age of Julius Caesar, uh, Crassus, at the Battle of Carai. Mm. And Augustus had decided that it wasn't worth the effort of of trying to bring the Parthians to heel, that they were just, it was too hard a nut to crack. So he had established a kind of cold, it wasn't even a cold war. He'd, he'd established a kind of peace, a modus vivendi with the Parthians. But Hadri- but Trajan is, is very, very ambitious for military glory. And I think comes to believe his own legend. Um, and so as he had done with the with the Dacians, so he does with the Parthians, he builds up an enormous concentration of military manpower in Syria. And as you say, he first of all, he tries to, well, he does. I mean, he succeeds in subduing um, the lands to the north of, of what's now Iraq. So um, the eastern kind of reaches of what is now Turkey, Armenia, yeah. um, those kind of territories. And he, he does that pretty well. And then he launches the invasion of Iraq, the... Um, uh, the Parthians melt away. Trajan reaches the Persian Gulf. Um, he uh, sees an Indian a ship sailing off for India, and he he weeps that he he cannot follow in Alexander's footsteps and reach India himself. And it's all it's all kind of very very, you know, he's posing as Alexander. He's posing as the great conqueror. He's very very aware. You know, if the if the cameras were there, he'd be playing up to the camera. Um, but it, it it all disintegrates and a bit like, I suppose, a bit like George Bush, mm. you know, landing on that aircraft carrier and saying mission, mission accomplished. accomplished. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Trajan kind of does the same. But even as he's doing it, insurgency is breaking out. Um, and Hadrian just decides it's not worth it's not worth the effort. And so he he withdraws troops from um, Mesopotamia. He patches up a peace with the Parthian kings. And Hadrian's policy is very much to say that um, Parthia doesn't really deserve to be conquered by the Romans. It's just a load of desert. Who cares? Nobody really nobody really cares about them. In the same way that that why would anyone care about the Germans? It's just a load of bogs and forests. Mm. And why would anyone care about the Caledonians? I mean, they're you know just just midges and mm. awful people, mm. kind of screaming. So he builds um, a series of fortifications al- along the the, the desert the, the desert borders of the Sahara. Mm. Um, uh, beyond the Rhine, and most famously of all, in the north of what is now England, so Hadrian's Wall, which is the inspiration for the Wall of Ice in Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. Um, but this isn't a defensive strategy so much as um, a gesture of contempt towards those who lie outside the Roman Empire. So it's 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 a bit like a billionaire putting up an electric fence around mm. his estate mm. to keep to keep the indigent, to keep the poor out of it. Um, so Trajan, um, Hadrian is not in any way saying that he doesn't have the, the Romans don't have the right if they want to, to go off and beat up the, the Caledonians or the Germans or even the Parthians if they want to, but it's just, it's not worth the effort. So Hadrian's wall, for instance, is not a defensive system so much as a statement of Roman power that is designed to intimidate and is designed to rub the noses of those who lie beyond it, that they are not worthy of inclusion within the great garden that is the Roman Empire. So it's not necessarily a aggressive tactic or an exclusionary an tactic. I mean, it, it, kind of, I mean it, well, walls are aggressive in my it's mind. Kind of, I mean, it's, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, building a wall between the United States and Mexico, I think would be interpreted, is interpreted by the Mexicans as a pretty aggressive statement. I mean, I mean it's not yes. viewed by the Mexicans as, as a, you know. It's not a friendly gesture. <laughs> it's not a friendly gesture. Right, right, exactly so. Right, 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 exactly. Right, right. But but he's not right. He he wasn't necessarily trying to necessarily start conflicts or things like that. But it is a kind of keep out or you. Yeah, you're not he, welcome he, he here. didn't want the riffraff. Yeah, mm, mm. basically to be to be within the Roman Empire is an enormous privilege because mm. the Roman Empire is the best. The gods have given the Romans the best portions of the world to rule, mm. and and anything anywhere outside it is is by definition terrible. That's mm. basically the message. Mm. And and yet he also has these other building plans for for Athens as well, though, right? So he's 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 he's, right, he's because, erecting because some things to keep people out and erecting other really nice things for the people inside of sorts, yeah. Yeah, because um Hadrian is a great lover of 
Greek culture. So as a young man, he's called Griculus, the, the little Greek. Um, he, he grows a beard. He's the first um, the first ruler of, of, of the eastern half of the Mediterranean since Alexander um, to, to have a beard. Um, and the beard is, on one hand, a symbol of his identification with the legionaries, because legionaries often wear beards. But it's also a statement of his enthusiasm for Greek philosophy, because Greek philosophers wear beards. Um, and so Hadrian wants to integrate the Greek half of the empire and make it feel more Roman. Mm. Um, and so he sponsors um, what's called the Panhellenion. It's a kind of Greek equivalent of the European Union. Mm. Um, and he chooses Athens to be its capital and he builds it up and sponsors it and, you know, all kinds of civic adornments. And um, he is in a way uh, plotting a course for the Roman future where in the, you know, in the very long run, the, the centre of gravity in the Roman Empire will become Greek-speaking because the western half of the empire, including Rome, will, will fall away and the capital of, of the Roman Empire will become a Greek-speaking city, mm -hmm. Constantinople. Mm -hmm. um, and so when, um, when, when Constantinople finally falls to the, uh, to the Turks in 1453, um, the Greeks who are defending Constantinople call themselves Romeoi, Romans. Mm -hmm. And the, the Turks call call the lands of the, of the former lands of the Byzantine Empire Rome after mm -hmm. Rome. Mm -hmm. So, what Hadrian is doing there in kind of integrating Greece and Greek culture and Greek aspirations and Greek ambitions and Greek self identifications with the ideal of of, of Roman universal power has a very very long legacy, reaching right the way into the end of the Middle Ages. So. Yeah, he's very. I think a very significant figure. Mm. Yeah, I mean, he's he's from I think modern day Spain, right? He's by, by That's right, as Trajan was. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I mean, of Roman descent, so the Roman right, settlers right, right. have gone out there, and the the Romans have the they have um, what they call coloniae. So that's where you know our idea of, of the colonial comes from. But colonies have a very specific legal role in the Roman world. They are little implantations of Roman culture in non in in non roman territory so initially in italy but then increasingly across the whole of the roman empire probably the most famous one um is a colony planted on the um uh the rhine mm. which still bears that name so it's colonia mm. today's cologne. cologne um and these are places where people speak latin you know mm. they're modeled on kind of roman town planning and everything mm. so another one would be corinth so when St. Paul writes to the Corinthians mm -hmm. that these are not Greeks he's writing to, they are Romans. Mm. Uh, Beirut, Beritus, that, mm. that also was a great center. That was a colony. So that was a great center of, of, of Roman culture. Mm. Um, but what's interesting about Hadrian's um, kind of Greek European equivalent of the European Union is that actually Corinth is integrated into mm. that. So there's a sense that a, a Roman city in Greece can be thought of as Greek. And I guess it's the emergence of what we would call Greco Roman civilization. Mm -hmm. um, and Hadrian obviously thinks this is a tremendous plan, a tremendous wheeze. Um, and so he he um he tries to adopt it as a policy in Judea, where the ruins of Jerusalem are garrisoned by a legion, you know, ever since the destruction of of, of Jerusalem and the temple by uh, by Titus and his legions uh, decades before. And Hadrian thinks it would be a tremendous idea to turn this into a, a colonia. So he calls it Aelia Capitolina. Aelius is his family name. Mm. Um, so he's naming it after himself. And Capitolina is a, an allusion to the, the Capitol, where the great temple of Jupiter of the Capitol, Capitol Capitoline Ju Jupiter, is, is stationed. And so he's doing Jerusalem tremendous honour. He's naming it after himself, and he's naming it after the great god of the Romans. But obviously this goes down like a cup of cold sick with, <laughs> with the Judeans themselves. And so there's another terrible revolt. And so this is one of the, the great tragedies of Trajan's, of Hadrian's reign, is that this, this extraordinary empire emperor who, more than any other emperor who had ruled the Roman world, was so sympathetic to the aspirations of uh, the peoples ruled by Rome precipitates the most murderous and bloody rebellion in Roman history. And it, it, it culminates in the expulsion of the Judeans from their own homeland. They're expelled from Judea. Mm -hmm. And Judea is renamed by Hadrian, Palestina, so Palestine. Mm 
Mm. And, you know, the consequences of that are with us to this day. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So we get one of the last people you talk about in the book is Antonius Pius, right? And uh, how he, what's his aim of trying to keep no major military conflicts during his reign? Well, he's and... he he's adopted by Hadrian as his son, and so this is what happens throughout. Um, uh, once Domitian is dead, uh, uh, basically the the policy is that an emperor will adopt as his son the man he thinks is most suited mm. to succeed him and to rule the empire. And it's actually a system that works very well. Um, and Hadrian adopts Antoninus Pius, who, as his name suggests, Pius isn't pious in our sense. It's someone who is uh, alert to his responsibilities to the gods. Mm. And if you have an emperor who's alert to his responsibility to the gods, then that's great news for the empire because um, paying the gods their dues are a bit like taking out insurance. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's if things start to go wrong, then you know that you haven't been paying the gods their due. Antoninus Pius does. The, the the world is at peace. And basically, I didn't go on to cover at him because nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's nothing to write about, really. Um, he keeps and the peace. what you know, yeah. So so in a way, I mean, that's the um that's the noblest legacy for a mm. for an emperor is is that nothing much happens in his mm. reign. Mm. The the last question, so obviously you get Marcus Aurelius after that, which you mentioned earlier, and it's kind of this five good emperors there. I guess the the the, the last question I have for you is is kind of twofold. I guess is uh, they're kind of separate questions, but you know the, we talk about this golden age, you know the Pax Romana, this golden age of Rome. But I guess we we've talked about it a little bit throughout the conversation. But what does that indicate for us? I guess in the modern era, and and kind of connected with that is. We seem to have a kind of distaste now for empire, right? We don't like empire Absolutely, and yes. colonialism and all these things. And at the same time, we're, we we should obviously do history and understand it. But, you know, how do we not have, you know, three cheers for empire? Maybe one and a half on some things. But how do we, how do we get, you know, be able to understand it historically, but to also be able to say, well, this isn't a, we're not, you know, saying all the wonderful things about empire either. How do we navigate that balance? Here? I think it's a massive snarl of, compl- of, of, of paradoxes and ambivalences. I, I think it's partly down to the sheer glamour of, of, of the Roman Empire in its heyday. So people love, I mean, that's why people love Gladiator. It's the, yeah. you know, it's the power of the legions. It's the, 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 the scale and sweep of Roman monuments in the heart of the capital. Um, it's the wealth on display. It has a kind of inherent glamour and power, I think that is seductive but at the same time we are also the heirs of of um the christians who um you know who who condemned rome as the whore of babylon and i think because um actually you know in the long run the most significant event of the first two centuries um of of uh, the first two centuries ad is the crucifixion of jesus by the apparatus of an imperial power there is a kind of in christian culture an inherent suspicion of empire that simply hadn't been there in the roman world and so in that sense our attitudes to the roman empire are a kind of tug of war between roman attitudes and christian attitudes Mm. um and the two have become confused because of course the roman empire becomes christian Mm. and so to the Romans of the imperial period um, in, following Constantine's conversion right the way through the Middle Ages and into the modern period, um, there is a sense that the Roman Empire is an expression of God's will, just as there is also a strong sense that, um, you know, it's better to be the crucified than the crucifier. It's better to be the tortured than the torturer. Um, and I think there's a particular kind of emphasis on that at the moment. You know, there's nothing quite as Western as uh, decolonization. You know, if you want, it's it's basically people who are Western or very influenced by Western ideas who think that decolonization is inherently a good thing. Um, so that's all very complicated. But an additional complication, I think, in the United States is that, um, you know, the infant republic uh, in the wake of the Revolutionary War was consciously modeled on the Roman example. And so that means that people in the United States, right from the very beginning, have always been conscious of what happened to Rome 
And there are two kind of great crisis points that I think have has haunted the American imagination. There's the decline and fall of the Roman Empire itself. So there's the anxiety that, that you know, the whole United States will disintegrate, that American power will implode, all that kind of thing. But the but the other great cause of anxiety is the fact that the Roman Republic fell. And so there's anxieties that the Republican form of government will go and be replaced by an autocracy. And that also, I think, is part of the kind of, in the United States, particularly culturally distinctive part of this kind of ambivalent attitude towards Rome. It's very, very fascinating. I've, I've never really quite, I, I know people make that analogy, but I never really kind of put it in context. That's, that's very, well, it's very because it's because uh, the founding fathers were so influenced by mm -hmm. by the histories of early Rome. You know, yeah. they expelled the king. Jefferson in particular had a, this kind of fantasy that, that the American Republic would be made up of yeoman farmers, very like the ancient Romans who would leave their plows to go and serve their country and then go back to their plows. Um, so that was very much kind of part of the, the the early myth. And it's why, you know, in your capital, you have a Senate and you have a, 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 a Capitol Hill. <laughs> I think if you've got those in your capital, it's very difficult, you know, and all the buildings look like they've come from ancient Rome. It's very difficult not to have <laughs> the Roman Empire mm -hmm. as a shadow in your imaginings. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that, you know, that's part of why um, the, 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 the reactions to the storming of the Capitol um, uh, a couple of years ago were is it a couple of years ago three years i'm losing track of how long ago it was two, but two you years. know the, uh, two years. As, as people pointed out the shaman with his mm -hmm. buffalo skin and everything i mean he looked like a kind of goth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seizing the you know yeah. seizing the senate house or something mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and those echoes come very very obviously to people i think yeah i mean having you know grown up around you know dc most of my life and and, and living close by any, I mean, you know, I've worked there and taught there and, you know, everything and, and going there, it's always a reminder. You go to the Lincoln Memorial right on Capitol Hill. You have the, watch yeah. the we have a uh, obelisk or whatever it is. You know, we, we have yeah. all of these, uh, you know, hints of this or these images of these things. And even if you go to other buildings, you know, the Treasury Building, things like that, you, you'll find the Supreme Court. The, yeah. the kind of way in which they're constructed and some of the layout is very reminiscent of a republic of sorts or trying to be in well also i mean the um the, the prohibition on building anything higher than the obelisk right right, um, right, right, right. It means that washington say unlike new york or mm -hmm. most american cities isn't a high rise in its center mm -hmm. um and that's so why it does people, that's why people it love does it. look like a pre-industrial yeah, city yeah in people that love that yeah people yeah. love it <laughs> Well, the book is called Pax, War and Peace in Rome's Golden Age. This is out through BASIC. Everyone should go pick it up. Uh, Tom, you've got a bunch of things you're doing, you're into. Where's the best place to find you? Where are the best places to, to, to get all the information so you're putting out? on uh, Twitter or X or whatever Elon whatever Musk is. is calling it by the time you get to hear this podcast. Uh -huh. I'm at Holland underscore Tom. And my podcast, The Rest is History, is available on whatever platform you get your podcast from. <laughs> as they <great>. say <laughs> that's great uh don this was so much fun it's a big big honor and pleasure and i really enjoyed talking about this with you and uh i i wish you all the best so thank you so much thank you so much for having me it's been it's been a blast of course